My name is Caroline Brown. I'll be telling the story about my son's journey with 22Q deletion syndrome, also known as the George syndrome. To start off, I will talk about the diagnosis um, or kind of the day that we found out in the process of getting the diagnosis. So like many others, I went to that 20 week ultrasound excited to confirm the gender. Uh, I, we had a pretty good idea that we already knew it was a boy. And so my husband didn't even get, I went by myself. And during the ultrasound, the, the woman was like, oh, the baby's not in the right position and kept like making me move and go up and down. And I was like, that's really weird because I'm sitting right here and I can see that the baby is in the right position. So I was kind of confused and so she went out of the room and was gone for quite a bit of time and I remember calling my husband and being like, Blake, I, I think something's wrong with the baby. I know the baby's alive because I see the heartbeat, but I think something's wrong. Well, so then another ultrasound tech came in with the other one and oh yeah, the baby's just not in the right position. Well after like 45 minutes of waiting, finally the doctor came in and was looking and she was like, you know, very plainly told me, you know, we see something wrong with your son's heart. This is what we see. And, you know, I was just like, I remember just being getting so hot, like thinking I was going to pass out. Like, and my very first question out of my mouth, instead of being like, you know, will he survive? What's the chance of living? Was, well, will I be able to breastfeed him? Because that was something that was important to me. And that was my first question I'm like still really embarrassed about. But, Anyway, so she explained it to me and was like, his thing, her, his heart is only about the size of my fingernail. And she was like, well, with this particular heart defect, which um, was later diagnosed as truncus arteriosus, is something called the George syndrome. And about one in 60 with a heart defect have the George syndrome. So I had to write it all down. And I remember just kind of for the remainder of my pregnancy, not even like, you know, do I prepare for this baby? Just really struggling. And my husband said, you know, I said, you know, I just never saw this for our family. This isn't anything I ever envisioned. Cause you, you know, who does? You wouldn't even, you wouldn't wish something like that upon anyone. And he was like, I always saw something like this for my family. And so that definitely gave me the, the strength to go on. And, and I did feel like, okay, I know that like we were given this child and that like we definitely can handle it. And like, you know, I almost felt blessed. Like, thank God this child with this condition is going to us. Somebody who will no matter what, like love him and care for him and, you know, hopefully provide the best care for him. That after the ultrasound and that had first heard the word, the George syndrome, um, they had me do an amniocentesis and that is what ultimately confirmed his diagnosis. So I did know my whole pregnancy, which some people don't know until after the baby is born. So I really liked knowing I would go back and change and not want to know. They set me up with a cardiologist to get an echo, which is a more detailed ultrasound of the particular heart defect. And the cardiologist just could not have been better and, and given us, you know, such a good um, outlook on what to expect. And um, about a year prior, a pediatric heart surgeon had moved to Oklahoma, which is where we're from, and was at the Oklahoma Children's Hospital. So we were very relieved to know that we would be able to stay right here in our home state and, you know, be at home and, and that he would just, you know, be there. So um, it was a little bit overwhelming having to, you know, switch doctors. And, and then for the remainder of my pregnancy, I had to get an ultrasound every single week to make sure that he was practicing breathing, that he was growing okay, along with the George syndrome are a bunch of symptoms. 
So I remember just every single ultrasound, just bugging the crap out of the ultrasound tech. Are his kidneys okay? Does he have a cleft palate? Does he, because you know, I had read online and it was kind of like until he arrived, we didn't know what to expect because you read all of these different symptoms and so, you know, you don't know what, what in particular he is going to have. And, and we still don't know what all, we know, you know, a little what he has physically, but things can always change. So he was born and um, the, they had originally diagnosed him with something called hemitruncus, but they then said it was no, it was truncus arteriosus type one once he was born. It was a very uneventful birth. It went great. And um, I felt so bad for all of the people in the room because I mean, I, my, my doctor was like, you know, you're not gonna get to hold him. They're gonna rush him up. So I was definitely prepared for the worst. And, you know, I got to hold him for a little bit and I just felt so bad for, I don't know why I felt bad for the doctors, but, you know, having to hand them over and there were just tears coming down my, my face because, you know, it was hard having to, to like be separated from him after growing him inside me for nine months and um, I could just tell they all felt so, so bad for me, but um, once we you know, he got settled in the NICU and didn't even have to be on oxygen, which was really good. And they they confirmed his heart defect and, you know, were running all these tests and everything, you know, was like looking optimistic. And, and I really felt, you know, excited for the first time. Like, okay, I have this baby. I can breathe now. He's here and I love him. And I've heard that before that, you know, whenever you get a... Um, Whenever you, you get, whenever you have a baby with a diagnosis, sometimes it's a little bit hard to attach yourself to them. And in my case, it was. And so finally meeting him was like just such a huge relief to me and, you know, reassured me, okay, like I am going to attach with this baby. I do love this baby so much. Um, it was just, I still kind of had a little bit of hesitation because, you know, I knew he would be having heart surgery and it's like, I'm gonna fall in love with this human and what if he's not here for very long? Or, you know, that was, that was like a hard thing to have to think about, but it was our reality. And um, so he was scheduled for, for surgery for about a week after his birthday. So generally um, they have to be six pounds to have heart surgery and he was born at over seven pounds so we were in the clear for heart surgery and he was just doing so well not needing to be on oxygen and whatnot well then there was um a little there was like a thing started to fill up and there were children who were in um who needed surgery more than he did and so we ended up having to wait two weeks which was fine because it was you know it was, i felt like it was a little bit of a waste of our time but it was nice to get those cuddles in before his surgery and um and it was a little bit stressful and like oh his surgery will be today oh no it won't be today oh it'll be today no it won't be today and then you know things have to go right in order for them to have surgery they're um i don't know if it's like they're they're he had to get like blood transfusions before both surgeries and um or before the the initial date and then they canceled it and then whenever they rescheduled he had to get a transfusion again and then it was confirmed you know he he did have the george syndrome by a blood test which you know a little piece of me was like oh like maybe it's a mistake um you know the morning of the nurse um assured us that if you know she could go anywhere in the world to have heart surgery that she would use this surgeon and we felt very comfortable and confident with him and so we um had to hand him over had to you know watch him be wheeled into the the or which is still something that just you know scars me and so i thought about like him just kind of following falling asleep going into the light and and like all the guardian angels of people who had been like praying for him and whatnot, like their hands, like leading the surgeons. And 
it was it was hard like having to get through that surgery and they kept calling with updates and you know just like waiting for that phone to ring it's like how do you even relax but everything for the most part went okay he had to come out with his chest open because it was still really swollen and he had to be on a pacemaker for a few days so like long story short we ended up being in the NICU for two months total he had some major feeding struggles and that's common with 22Q and so that was something that that we expected and so he had to come home with a NG tube and and um, my husband and I my husband and I had to learn to to place it which I am not the most gentle so having to you know I am not a medical professional for a reason it is not my alley so uh, having to learn to do that was was kind of a challenge um so he had to come home with an NG tube which if you don't know is a tube that you know goes through their nose into their stomach and um, that's how they get feedings and at the time that he came home from the hospital, he was on 13 different medicines. And um, one of the things that is common with DeGeorge is that they have a hard time regulating their calcium levels. And that was, especially in times of stress, and that was an issue for Shepard um, post-surgery. But um, once kind of he got his levels up, he's, you know, continued to maintain them. his birth and um, surgery and NICU stay and so what was life like in the first year of him being born and because he was pre diagnosed with this and then was in the NICU for so long um, we were really lucky because we were able to get Sooner Start right away, which in Oklahoma, it's called Sooner Start. I think every state has it. And it's a program that helps um, children with developmental delays and um, diagnoses. And so they were here like, you know, right after. And I remember whenever I was talking to them, like thinking he had every single problem. Like, oh, I, you know, I don't think he hears. I, I don't think he sees very well. I don't think he, and um, so as you know, time went on, that was just not the case. But you know, scared mom thought was just totally, totally um, expecting the worst. Um, well, so throughout the whole first year of his life, they came several times a month and worked with him. And then on, at I around nine it. months old, we um, put him in yeah. physical therapy. And he didn't start sitting up until almost a year, which I, was just a huge challenge for me, you know, especially the world of like social media and comparison and, you know, just seeing kind of how far behind he was. It really weighed on me, but he ultimately kind of doing things on his own time and, and that was fine too. It was just, you know, hard to accept. It's easier said than done, I guess you would say. Um, but I'm just so thankful to all of the therapists who did work with him because, you know, they all loved him and we loved all the people who got to work with him and it, they were such a great support system for us. And so I'll always be forever grateful for all of those people who worked with him and really got to know him and cherished him. Within his first year, he did have to get um, a helmet. And I've, it's been so long, I've 
you like forgot what the name is but basically he um had a flat head and i mean it was flat so flat so he had to wear a helmet pretty much like from november till may so i mean a really long time and um, he looked so cute in that helmet but you know at first it was a little bit embarrassing taking him out like oh my gosh what are people gonna think but that's something i've had to get over you know is what people think um, he's so small and so many times we would get oh how old is he or you know is he underfed because he does he is very very skinny so some of the issues that he had is that he he was failure to thrive which like whenever i saw that on his paperwork i about died because it you know just about killed me but so up until about six months whenever we could like start introducing food i mean the struggle was so real trying to get that boy to eat because he did not want to um, so once at six months and he started food, I would say things improved. And then once he turned 12 months, we started introducing the Pediasure. And like he just completely took off. He liked it, thank God. Really just completely took off. Um, and well, in his own terms, took off. I mean, he's still very small. He's, um, you know, I think like some of my friends who have like six months old are bigger than him. He's almost two. But that's to be expected with the George. So... Some of the things that he um, has had is he um, has had reoccurring ear infections, and so they did um, tubes in his ears. And then it's like he still constantly has ear infections, and so that kind of makes him sick. He vomits all the time. Like if I had a dollar for every time I think he's like, vomited, like seriously, I would be living so good. Um, because it, I mean, that also was, you know, a huge, huge struggle. And it's just something we, we deal with. And he, he chokes easier. He, um, things like run out of his nose, which is expected to, um, cleft palates are common and he doesn't have, he has like a, a little bit of a sad mucus cleft. So it's like a little bit, instead of being hard up there, it's like a little bit, um, soft. And so that's kind of what the issue was there as far as why things were coming out of his nose. Um, but he, he eats fine. He doesn't have a very big appetite. He had to go on a, a medicine around, I would say like six months, he went on a medicine to kind of help increase his appetite. And I just, it made him like drowsy. I really don't think that, that it helped that much at 22 months, stopped physical therapy, started walking at 18, and, you know, we were just so worried about where he's going to be or what, you know, what's going to happen, and he has just totally surpassed everything that we thought, and we're so thankful for that, and he's such a sweetie, he loves bath time, he loves learning new sign language and playing with his sister. And he's a total daddy's boy. Every time his dad leaves, he just like hangs out at the door. And um, he really has proven to be a fast learner. And so we know things will, you know, continue to be monitored as life goes on. But, you know, I, if I could just go back and tell myself not to worry, to enjoy each moment, um, you know, then, then I would. And those are kind of my... Those are kind of my words to other mothers and parents who are getting this diagnosis for their child is that, you know, just really enjoy the moment because these are special people who are entrusted to us and, you know, they do things on their own time and their own way, but they're so sweet and so loving and just, you know, wonderful, wonderful children and they may not be normal but to us it is normal and there's challenges with with every child no matter what you know there's there's light at the end of the